And before engaging in prayer and Bible study, I shall read from Mount of Blessings, beginning with the first paragraph on page 151. The chapter is based on the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer was twice given by our Savior, first to the multitude in the Sermon on the Mount, and again, some months later, to the disciples alone. The disciples had been, for a short time, absent from their Lord. When on their return, they found him absorbed in communion with God. Seeming unconscious of their presence, he continued praying aloud. The Savior's presence was irradiated with a celestial brightness. He seemed to be in the very presence of the unseen, and there was a living power in his words, as of one who spoke with God. The hearts of the listening disciples were deeply moved. They had marked how often he spent long hours in solitude in communion with his Father. His days were passed in ministering to the crowds that pressed upon him, and in unveiling the treacherous sophistry of the rabbis, and this incessant labor often left him so utterly wearied that his mother and his brothers, and even his disciples, had feared that his life would be sacrificed. What did they fear? They feared that Jesus was doing too much, and that if he thus continued to overtax his strength, he would not live long. They felt sure he would soon take sick and pass away. Did their expectations come true? No. The opposite of what they feared took place. What made the difference? What made him equal to the task? Was it not prayer? If Jesus could receive sufficient strength in prayer, in prayer to perform his duties, why cannot we? But as he returned from the hours of prayer that closed the twelfth day, they marked the look of peace upon his face, the sense of refreshment that seemed to pervade his presence. It was from hours spent with God that he came forth, morning by morning, <clears throat> to bring the light to bring the light of heaven to men. The disciples had come to connect his hours of prayer with the power of his words and works. Now, as they listened to his supplication, their hearts were awed and humbled, and he ceased praying. As he ceased praying, it was with a conviction of their own deep need that they exclaimed, Lord, teach us to pray. What one lesson did the disciples learn from having heard Jesus pray? They realized that they did not as yet know how to pray, so they asked him to teach them how. And that is how it came that Jesus reiterated the prayer at that particular time. Jesus gives them no new form of prayer. That which he, was, he has before taught them, he repeats, as if he would say, You need to understand what I have already given. It has a depth of meaning you have not yet fathomed. The Savior does not, however, restrict us to the use of these exact words. Jesus did not give them something new, but the same prayer over again. Why? Because, at the first time, they had failed to, gr to grasp the principles, the principal things of that prayer. Let us examine the main principles of the prayer. 1. Our Father. To say our Father, not my Father, especially when praying in public, helps us to realize that we all need that we are all brothers. Two, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. To be able honestly to say this, we must really comply with God's will. Indeed, we must let his will, not our own, be done. Three, give us this day our daily bread. Jesus pulled nothing out of storage, so to speak. He received day by day a fresh supply for all his needs, for himself and for his workers, and for his work. Yes, everything, yes, everything, topics for preaching, the wine at the marriage, the bread to feed the multitude, and the coin to pay the tax. All these he received as he had need of them. Never did he lack a thing. 
If we make God's kingdom our chief business as he did, work for it as he worked for it, pray as he prayed, trust as he trusted, then there will be no reason for us to receive less than he. Heaven's wealth would be at our disposal. In fact, he assures us, all things shall, all these things shall be added unto thee. Four, give us, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. We are not to ask greater forgiveness for ourselves than we are willing to give to others. Five, lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. Why? Because all our deeds testify that thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. He will not disappoint us if we pray and live as his prayer and example teach. He cannot deny us answers to our prayers if we know what we are praying for, if we ask for the things we really need to have, the things he himself is anxious that we have. Before praying for anything, study it over first, so that your prayer too may stand forever and ever. Amen. As one with humanity, he presents his own ideal of prayer, words so simple that they may be adopted by the little child, yet so comprehensive that their significance can never be fully grasped by the greatest minds. We are taught to come to God with our tribute of thanksgiving, to make known our wants, to confess our sins, and to claim His mercy in accordance with His promise. Shall we now engage in a season of prayer? Who will volunteer to pray for us? Study Isaiah 2 and 3. That which shall be in the last days. Our study for this afternoon is taken from Isaiah chapter 3. But since the story or the prophecy of this chapter begins in the preceding chapter, we cannot prof profitably study the third chapter independently of the second. No one, by beginning to study a subject from the middle, backward or frontward, can learn what is about what it is about in its continuity if one is to learn the full truth of a subject he must study it in its entirety dogs and cats but not civilized human beings start eating the pie from the center out as intelligent human beings as god's people we ought to eat the pie right now how do i know that the prophetic subject of the third chapter begins with the second chapter. The very first word of chapter 3, the preposition for, implies that something has gone before. To pick up the continuity of inspiration's burden and also to get the proper background of the subject, we are compelled to start our, pro our study with the, verse, the very verse Isaiah was led to start the prophecy with. Isaiah 2, chapter 1. The word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. What was Isaiah led to reveal? Things concerning Judah and Jerusalem, the church, God's people. We are interested to know, though, the very generation of that people, because if the prophecy is concerning our generation, then it will have greater meaning to us. Its teachings will be especially adaptable to our present needs. That is why we must ascertain who are the very people to which the prophecy is addressed. Let us read verse 2. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it. The prophet was shown things concerning the church in the last days, not in his days, but in our days, things which we ought to know. The statement, last days, in itself leads us to the last days of the time of the end. As we were shown last Sabbath that the time of the end began in the 18th century, we need now only to find out how long after the 18th century this prophecy is to take place. 
For the answer, let us read verse 3. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths, for out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Since we, as well as this whole world, know that no such gathering as called for in this verse has ever taken place, it becomes obvious that the prophecy is yet future. Some years ago, I was interested to know about Isaiah 2, and so I interrogated a well-informed preacher, who also was an eloquent speaker. He answered as emphatically as he could by saying, That will never be fulfilled. Wall, of course, I did not at that time know, and his answer to my question did not help me one way or another. Now, though, I see that God himself declares that it will be fulfilled, and him I must put my trust. For if this prophecy cannot be fulfilled, then what assures me that any of the prophecies can be fulfilled? Moreover, if this prophecy is not to be fulfilled, then evidently the gospel work will not be finished either. For this prophecy tells us the way the work is to be finished, that the law of the Lord is to go out of Zion, and the word out of Jerusalem, not from Tacoma Park, not from Mount Carmel Center, and not from some other place either. When this happens, then many na nations shall say, Let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. Isaiah 2 verse 4 And he shall judge among the nations, and shall rebuke many people, and shall beat their swords, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. Since we are the forerunners of this coming event, of the establishment of the mountain of the Lord's house, then there is no escaping the conclusion that these chapters of Isaiah were penned for our benefit, the church today. Being the forerunners of this great and glorious event, we must give special heed to what these chapters have to say. This we must do for two reasons. One, because we ourselves must profit by them, and two, because we must carry their message to the church. For the latter reason, the scriptures are open to us at this very time. Let us, no, let us now hear the Lord's plea. Verse 5, O house of Jacob, come ye, and let us walk in the light of the Lord. Here is a plea made to the house in which the 144,000 are descendants of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel, the house of Jacob, the church of today. The Lord's concern, the church walk in the light of the Lord, implies that she is not walking in his light, and his command, found in the last verse of this chapter, emphatically reveals that she is definitely walking in the light of men. The Lord commands, Isaiah 2 verse 22, Cease ye from man whose breath is in his nostrils, for wherein is he to be accounted of? The immediate reason that her members should cease from man is told in the verses that follow, Isaiah 3 verses 1 to 4. For behold, the Lord, the Lord of hosts, the take away from Jerusalem and from Judah, the stay and the staff, the whole stay of bread and the whole stay of water, the mighty man and the man of war, the judge and the prophet and the prudent and the ancient and the captain of fifty and the cat and the honorable man and the counselor and the cunning artificer and the eloquent orator. And I will give children to be their princes, and babes shall rule over them. Those who have been exalting themselves, causing the common people to follow them, rather than causing them to follow the Lord and His advancing truth, are to be taken away. Think of it. God cannot use the learned men, but He can use the children to finish His great work. The, bre the brethren who are endeavoring to make us believe that this prophecy will never be fulfilled, should now ponder over the matter. Along with the more recent statement, few great men will be engaged in the last work. Testimonies, Volume 5, page 80. Now let us turn back to chapter 2, verse 6. 
Therefore thou hast forsaken thy people, the house of Jacob, those men that are causing the people to follow them, because they be replenished from the east, and are soothsayers like the Pharisees, and they please themselves in the children of strangers. When among the unconverted they are pleasing themselves, not the Lord, moreover they are soothsayers. They ably explain away the truths rather than magnify it. Chapter 2, verse 7. Their land also is full of silver and gold, neither is there any end of their treasures. Their land is also full of horses, neither is there any end of their chariots. The house of Jacob, to which God is here talking, is in a land that is full of silver, of gold, and of chariots. There is no end to the number of them, since there is no land in all God's world that is as enriched with silver, gold, chariots as is this land, the land of America, very obvious it is that it is the land to which God refers. He is this day, brother, sister, talking to you, to me, in newly revealed truth and in unmistakable language. Shall you, shall I gladly comply with the Lord's wishes? Verse 8. Their land also is full of idols. They worship the work of their own hands, that which their own fingers have made. They are proud of what they can do. Their accomplishments have become their idols, and they worship them. Verse 9. And the men and the mean man boweth down, and the great man humbleth himself. Therefore forgive them not. They are all alike, he declares, the mean and the great and the good. Forgive them not, he exclaims, except, of course, they repent. Verse 10. Enter into the rocks, and hide thee in the dust, for fear of the Lord, and for the glory of his majesty. What are they to do? Just that. When God manifests his power, they will be frightened. They will run to the rocks and to the mountains. The events of this particular verse run parallel with those of Revelation 6, verse 15 to 17, which says, And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Very evidently, Isaiah's prophecy meets its fulfillment in the time of the sixth seal, the time, therefore, in which the sinners in Zion are to cry to the rocks and to the mountains to hide them, obviously is at hand. It is even at the door. Men will not then be running to and fro over the mountains for entertainment as they are now doing, but they will be running to the mountains for fear. I think we had better quit fooling ourselves and make up our minds to serve the Lord. How do I know that the great day of the Lord is almost here? I know it because it comes during the sixth seal, during the sealing of the 144,000. And I know it also because after the breaking of the seventh seal, the earth is lightened, preparations for which are now being made. And what happens when the earth is lightened? All nations flow unto the mountain of the Lord's house. Then it shall come to pass that, Isaiah 2 verse 11, the lofty looks of men shall be humbled, and the haughtiness of men shall be bowed down, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. Man has long been exalting himself, so much so, in fact, that there are perhaps only a few Christians in the world that are really following the light of the Lord. Most of them are following man. Moreover, not all present truth believers have yet awakened either. How do I know? I know it because I see them still taking sides, one for Paul and another for Apollos, as it were. Verse 12. For the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon every one that is proud and lofty, and upon every one that is lifted up, and he shall be brought low. 
Oh, what a time! Such a humiliating time we are coming to. What a time! What a humble pie awaits the so-called wise. Verses 13, 15, and 16. And upon all the cedars of Lebanon, that are high and lifted up, and upon all the oaks of Bashan, and upon every high tower, and upon every fenced wall, and upon all the ships of Tarshish, and upon all pleasant pictures. Figurative expressions, of course, referring to the great men who in the people's eyes are as the cedars of Lebanon, and as the oaks of Bashan, chapter 2, verses 17 and 18. And the loftiness of men shall be bowed down, and the haughtiness of men shall be made low, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day, and the idols he shall utterly abolish. What idols are to be abolished? The verse following will tell us. Verse 19, And they shall go into the holes of the rocks, and into the caves of the earth, for fear of the Lord, and for the glory of his majesty, when he ariseth to shake terribly the earth. The idols that are to be abolished are idols that walk. They are men whom the people have been idolizing, and those who still idolize them and continue to do it will with their idols run to the holes of the rocks and into the caves of the earth. Chapter 2, verse 20. In that day a man shall cast his idols of silver and his idols of gold, which they made each one for himself to worship, to the moles and to the bats. Three idols in all are mentioned. One, the works of men's hands. Two, the men that are revered. Three, the gold and the silver that are worshipped, as it were. Verse 21. To go into the clefts of the rocks and to the tops of the ragged rocks for fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty when he arises to shake terribly the earth. If we do not now, brother, sister, cast out all our idols, we shall be forced to later. And what good will it do us then? Chapter 3, verse 1. For behold, the Lord, the Lord of hosts, that doth take away from Jerusalem and from Judah the stay and the staff, the whole stay of bread and the whole stay of water. The time is at hand. The sinners will not have a drop to drink or a bite to eat. Who are among them? Chapter 3, verse 2 to 4. The mighty men, the man of war, the judge, and the prophet, and the prudent, and the ancient, and the captain of fifty, and the honorable men, man, and the counselor, and the cunning artificer, and the eloquent orator, having taken away the man that have been exalting themselves, and thus having freed his people, the Lord puts children and babes, so to speak, humble ones, to rule over his people. And I will give children to be their princes, and babes shall rule over them. The signs of the times are to be recognized by the condition revealed in Isaiah 3, verse 5. And the people shall be oppressed, every one by another, and every one by his neighbor. And the child shall behave himself proudly against the ancient, and the babe against the honorable. Are not these things already taking place? We need not be ignorant of the signs of the times. They are clear and distinct. And what a lesson for the unruly and disrespectful. Isaiah 3 verse 6. When a man shall take hold of his brother of the house of his father, saying, Thou hast clothing, be thou our ruler, and let this ruin be under thy hand. When this takes place, then a man shall say to his brother, You come and rule over us because you have clothing. It is perhaps eloquent to say, You can at least give us something to wear. Let this ruin be under your control. You can remedy the situation. You can save us. The people's way of thinking and acting in this time of trouble, ruin, and adversity of all kinds clearly reveals that they are not taking God into consideration. No, not at all. They are still trusting in men and goods. They hope that someone can remedy the situation, can save them from ruin. By their actions, 
by their actions they say, God has forsaken the earth. Do you see what the people are trusting in? In clothes? In man that has a good suit? Yes, clothes have become their gods, idols made with their own hands. Chapter 3, verse 6. In that day shall he swear, saying, I will not be an healer, for in my house is neither bread nor clothing. Make me not a ruler of the people. The one that is called to rule also shares the people's attitude. He declares that he is not able to heal the evil, that he too is poor. God, though, makes clear the cause of the trouble. Let us read chapter 3, verse 8. For Jerusalem is ruined, and Judah is fallen, because their tongues and their doings are against the Lord to provoke the eyes of his glory. Not the world, but Jerusalem is ruined, and Judah is fallen. Why? Because their doings and their tongues are against the Lord. What do they do and say? Whatever they do, they obviously provoke the eyes of his glory. What are the eyes of his glory? According to Isaiah 62 verse 3 and chapter 4 verse 5, the ever-living church of God, the depository of his revealed truth, is his glory. And according to 1 Samuel 9 9, the spirit of prophecy, the seer in their midst, constitutes the eyes of his church, the eyes of his glory. And that is just what they provoke. The spirit that leads into all truth, what they do, they are not ashamed of. They do it openly. Now you know for a fact that there is not a one who names himself a Christian that is talking outright against God. What professed Christians really do is say things against God's revealed truth without realizing that they are talking against the Holy Ghost. Even some present truth believers now and then drop a word of criticism here and a word there saying things, at least in most instances, to bolster their own reputation and down in others or to win someone to their own way of thinking at the expense of God's cause. Those kinds of sins are most insidious against the Holy Ghost, and the greater the ability of the one that is engaged in such practices, the greater the damage. Are these tongues of ours not given to us to speak the truth and nothing but the truth? Are they given to us to speak God's revealed truth in a way to exalt self, to get others to think our own way? The manner of some is perfectly described in Ezekiel's prophecy. Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 30 to 33. Also, thou son of man, the children of thy people still are talking against thee by the walls and in the doors and in the houses and speaking one to another, every one to his brother, saying, Come, I pray you, and hear what is the word that cometh forth from the Lord. And they come unto thee as the people cometh, and they sit before thee as my people, and they hear the words, but they will not do them. For with their mouth they shew much love, but their heart goeth after their covetousness. And lo, thou art unto them as a very lovely song, of one that, hate, that hath a pleasant voice, and can play well on an instrument. For they hear thy words, but they do them not. And when this cometh to pass, lo, it will come, then shall they know what a prop, that a prophet hath been among them. Perhaps most destructive of all, though, is this. Even unjust criticisms are often spoken in the hearing of the children and youth, and in the presence of the inexperienced and uninformed, damage that can never be altered. Ironical, indeed, parents laboring on the one hand to save their children and at the same time doing just the thing to drive them away from God and His truth. What a mystery! What nonsense! Chapter 3, verse 9. 
The shew of their countenance doth witness against them, and they declare their sin as Sodom. They hide it not. Woe unto their soul, for they have rewarded evil unto themselves. Yes, the sins that are committed are not the kind that people as a rule do in secret, but rather the kind that people are proud of, for they hide them not. They sin openly. And what could it be but doing those things in which the world takes pride, dressing like the world, talking like the world, and going to places where the world goes, being unruly, disobedient, indifferent, and contrary. Sad to say, some of these things are practiced even by present truth believers. Yes, even worse sins. Many present truth believers will not take orders. Then when things do not turn out right, they have someone to pin the wrong unto. They even question whether God be loading in his work. If he has taken the reins in his own hands, what can one use to illustrate acts of this kind? To say, what mystic baloney to pass on others is hardly adequate, because no one is really supposed to know exactly what baloney is made of. But Christians are expected to know and to speak the truth and nothing but the truth. But what is even still worse, some get hurt as if something is done without their being consulted first. They never, though, ask if the Lord has been consulted about it. They still want to be followed even by God himself. The very men who could have been a great help to Moses were a great hindrance the very ones who were creating trouble and discontent. And nothing did bring them to their senses, not the Lord himself, so the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them. Numbers 16, 26 to 33, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 400 and 405. Brother, sister, the time has come for us to get out of our childhood and become grown men in the Christian faith. The time has come for us all to take strong meat. Remember that those who are in the work to exalt themselves shall be humbled instead. The work we are doing would have gone into the dumps ere this if it had been dependent on human wisdom and human effort. Isaiah 3 verse 9 to 12 The shoe of their countenance doth witness against them, and they declare their sin as Sodom. They hide it not. Woe unto their souls, for they have rewarded evil unto themselves. Say ye to the righteous, that it shall be well with him, for they shall eat the fruit of their doings. Woe unto the wicked, it shall be ill with him, for the reward of his hands shall be given him. As for my people, children are their oppressors, rulers, and women rule over them. O my people, they which lead thee, cause thee to error, and destroy the way of thy paths. No, God himself cannot rule over the proud, self-important and self-sufficient. But, as to his people, even children and women rule over them. Thus, they are now being warned that the proud, who now rule over them, are causing them to err, destroying God's plan for them. A certain Davidian said, I hope the Lord will soon take the reins in his own hands. Moses knew that the Lord had taken the reins in his own hands to deliver Israel, but the multitude, even when they came down to the Red Sea, did not know that God had taken the reins in his own hands. They, too, thought everything was in Moses' hands. After they passed through the Red Sea, they sang the song of deliverance and understood that God's hand had delivered them. But soon after, they forgot and again accused and condemned Moses for bringing them into the desert wastes. And when they came to the borders of the promised land, he could not lead them into it, but he had to drive them back into the desert and keep them forty years in all. Yes, even the manna coming down to earth daily, along with the other wonders, failed to convince the multitude that God had taken the reins in his own hands. As a result, their carcasses fell in the desert. 
but the children whom they thought would never make the goal went into the land. Numbers 14, 1 to 3, 27 to 32, number 16, 63 to 65. So it is today. There is a certain class of people whom God himself could not convince of anything. Those who think he has not taken the reins in his own hands will always think thus, because they never take orders from any but themselves. They will continue to question and criticize everything in which they themselves have no part. They are not God's people regardless of their profession or of what they think or say. His real people, he declares, are able to take orders from anyone the Lord may appoint. Isaiah 3 verse 12 As for my people, children are their oppressors, rulers, and women rule over them. O my people, they which lead thee cause thee to err, and destroy the way of thy paths. Yes, anyone whom he appoints can rule over his true people, because they walk in the light of the Lord, not in their own sparks, he plainly states that those who now rule over them, those mentioned in verses 2 and 3, are causing his people to err, and are destroying the way of their right path. Isaiah three thirteen and 14 The Lord standeth up to plead, and standeth to judge the people. The Lord will enter into judgment with the ancients of his people, and the princes thereof. For ye have eaten up the vineyard, and the spoil of the poor is in your houses. Think of it, robbing the poor to enrich themselves. Even the places of worship is made a den of thieves. Men with talent have become tax collectors, not collecting tax on property, but on one's faith, emotions, reputation, pride, exaltation, and what not. Anything to add to their income. So while the poor are becoming poorer, the soothsayers are becoming richer. And while the latter's houses are used as pack rat nests, the house of God is used as a house of merchandise. We should be God-fearing people. We must never fall back into Laodiceanism. We should be considerate shepherds, not vehement grafters. Moreover, some are using very poor judgment. On the one hand, they are doing everything for the young in the home, and for the young in the faith, and on the other hand, they are doing all to ruin them both. How? By occasional remarks which create doubt and suspicion against the work of God. Such drops of poison are labeled and passed on as heart and headache medicine, as it were. But the result is a general exodus from both the home and the church. We are called to be reformers, not deformers. Gatherers with God, not scatterers with Satan. Let's be what we profess to be, and thus stand before the throne of God without guile in our mouths, and eventually without sinners in our midst. Isaiah 3 verse 14 The Lord will enter into judgment with the ancients of his people, and the princes thereof. For ye have eaten up the vineyard, and the spoil of the poor is in your houses. What a condemnation! Those that rule the people have eaten up the vineyard. Verse 15. What mean ye that ye beat my people to pieces and grind the faces of the poor, saith the Lord God of hosts? We must not disfigure the faces of the poor. We must instead make their hearts glad and their faces shine with the glory of God, not with the pretentious inventions of wicked men. If you think you should be all God wants you to be, then put out from among you the world. Retain only that which God's word approves and commands, and you shall reach your goal without fail. Read Testimonies, Volume 1, page 268-270. No longer be children, but full-grown Christians. You will, of course, have a struggle, but you shall overcome if you make the effort. Read over again, track number 14, pages 30 to 50.